Now you'll notice that in Romans earlier, uh, Romans chapter 8, let's go a quick review here for a minute. Uh, Paul reminds his readers that while life may be good, well, sometimes life doesn't seem good, it seems very difficult, but all is working out for good according to God's purposes. Things may appear bad in our lives, but working out for good is actually the principle that we see so demonstrated in the cross. What was the worst thing that, that happened in all of humanity? It was none other than humans, mankind, killing their creator. The worst thing. And to top it on that, they used the worst form of death, where crucifixion was the most lingering, painful, sense of torture that one could experience. The worst thing in history was done on the cross. We killed God, but we did it in such an immune, inhumane way. And the cross was no easy journey for Jesus. Think about it. He was perfect. That meant his sensory was way better than you and I. He had perfect vision. He had perfect sensory. He could sense things. His, his nervous system was absolutely perfect. And the pain that he experienced with the nails and the thorns and the lashings and being jerked upon that cross, all of that would be intensely painful for him. But it was on that cross we find the worst thing has become our best thing. For in the cross, and in his death and resurrection, we find life. Romans 9 reminds us that God, in his sovereign actions, has selected some from every generation to be saved. And God uses that principle of selection. And he uses, as Paul describes Abraham's walk, he says it wasn't just Abraham's descendants that were the blessed, the seed of Israel. It was one particular line of Abraham's descendants. He actually had three lines. The sons of Keturah at the end of his life with his third wife. The son of Hagar, Ishmael, his first wife, although a servant and a handmaid. But the son of his second wife, Sarah, Isaac, was the seed, the promised seed. And then we have Jacob. And Jacob had two sons. And Paul goes on to say, and it's not just the sons of Jacob that are blessed and part of the seed that, I, that I'm speaking of. It was not Esau. Malachi says it well. Esau, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now he's speaking on behalf of God in retrospect, and we looked at that. But then, as we go to Jacob, we discover it's not all of his sons either. Jacob was called, well, the word Jacob means a thief pickpocket, someone who was a stealer, someone who was a robber. Can you imagine being named, named that? You know, that, you know, you come into your class first day. So what's your name, pickpocket? <laughs> oh, <laughs> people are starting to go watch, watch where they, where they stand. But that, you don't let me line up in front of this guy. Um, so Jacob's name at the, towards the end of his life, changes from a thief. God gives him a new name. His name is now a prince, Israel. The name change is a description of the heart change. When you want to find out when a person gets saved in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, look for the name change. Simon, you're now Peter. The rock. I'm the rock. <laughs> he was not a rock until after the resurrection. We all know that. But it was a sign of God. Jesus himself speaking to him, there was going to be a change, a big change in his life. And the change was Jesus. And Jesus comes to a person and makes a change in their name, makes a change in their character. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is so critical for true salvation. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Someone once told me, they were an attendee at a particular church for many, many years. I've always been a Christian. Do you know that that is unbiblical? It is a lie from the devil. If you think that somebody is always a Christian, you're swallowing the lie of Satan. 
because Jesus tells the, the man who would be the most able to say that, Nicodemus, he tells, says to Nicodemus, you need to be born again. <coughs> and so there is no such thing as I'm always a Christian. Now, does that mean you have to be able to put a date on it? I can't put a date on mine, my salvation experience, so I'll be right there with you. I cannot tell you exactly the day. I didn't write it down. Wasn't the, I wasn't even sure I was saved until two weeks later, and I said, oh yeah, that was the day. And then being a kid of great 11 statue of 17-year-old, I just never wrote it down. Why? Well, because I had accepted so-called the Lord so many times in the past. And I said, well, the real true test will be, does he stick with me and do I stick with him? And that happened. So I kind of regret the fact that I didn't write it down, but nevertheless, so if you can't put a date on your salvation, that's okay. As one of our professors in Bible college used to say, better to know that you have life than to see the birth date and the death date on a, on a gravestone. In other words, do you have life? Are you a follower of Jesus? Has he given you eyes to see? Has he, I, I was talking to one gentleman this morning and he shared, I finally understand. I finally get it. I'm finally understanding this. And I go, well, that's what the blind man said. I once was blind and now I see. So the cross is our great salvation. And God used the story of these Old Testament saints to teach us that God was at work selecting, bringing thieves, bringing scoundrels, that's us, to the cross, to faith. Now, some would say to Paul, well, what happens? And he says, well, first of all, God selected the nation of Israel, the seed, the seed which would come, and the nation of Israel, by and large, rejected the message of the gospel, rejected the Messiah. Can you imagine? The Messiah is going to come one day. And someone says, this is the day. No, it isn't. And you have this huge debate. It's not the day. Oh, yes, it is. The Messiah has come. Oh, no, he has not. And so... Paul's group, he says, here's how you find out if, it's, if Jesus is the Messiah. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You don't have to go to Jerusalem to sacrifice. You, the sacrifice is over. Jesus died for our sins. It is by trusting the work of salvation that was done on the cross. Call upon Jesus. And when he answers, you'll know. You'll know that you have been saved. Well, then people would say to Paul, well, what about Israel? Romans 11 deals with this very important topic. Has God cast away his people? No, I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham. So Paul makes it very clear that he is an example of the proof that God has not cast away all of Israel. He is of the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest of the tribe, I might add. When you read about it, it was the only tribe in all of Israel that almost lost its position. It almost was totally exterminated in the judges. Israel had one tribe that the first king came from, and that was Benjamin. Saul, the son of Kish. But, it wasn't Benjamin that was going to be the royal tribe. It was Judah. And Genesis predicted that way back in Genesis 50. And so Paul says, I'm a clear example. I was of that tribe, the smallest of tribes, but I have trusted in the Savior. But then he goes on to say, think about the pattern here. 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 17. I thank Christ Jesus. This is Paul's words. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord. He enabled me. He counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man. I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, who did he say he was? Chiefest. There's a chief I respect. 
He was the chief of sinners. But you know, we are the chief of sinners too. Because if God were to take a record of all of our thoughts and all of our miscues and all of our misdeeds, just in 24 hours, the list would be extremely long, wouldn't it? But the grace of God is this. Jesus died for every sin, past sins, present sins, future sins. He died for them all. And we called upon him to save us from all of that, and he has. And Paul said that, this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show a pattern to those who were going to believe in him. Did you catch that? Paul is the pattern. What was Paul doing when he got saved? He was fighting with God. Where was he going? To persecute Christians. Why was he going? Because he thought he was right. He was wrong, wrong, wrong. When you're wrong three times at the baseball plate, you strike out. And he was striking out miserably before God. But... It says that God set him as a pattern. What did he do? He slammed dunked Paul, gave him a whack with some light, blinded him, and then said to him, you're going to be in darkness for three days. Think about it, because you've been in darkness for years. And that was when he suddenly realized this, everything. Who art thou, Lord? Why am I persecuting you? Who are thou? He knew. When you address a voice from heaven as Lord, you're talking to Jehovah. And what does the voice say? I am Jesus. <gasps> what a moment for Paul. Can you imagine? The very movement you have been persecuting is the person speaking to you. And not only speaking, but speaking with authority. And you just, what have I done? Well, Paul is a good example of the pattern of salvation. Going one way, and God intervenes and says, Ah, oh, I want you. I want you to believe in me. And I'm going to bring that to pass because you're going to trust these things. Now, do you know there are people that have the same experience as Paul? And do not believe. It's unfortunate, but it's true. Because God will give, he is not willing that any should perish. And when the day stand, and there's that person is standing before an almighty God, and he will say, what did you do with my son? And they will remember the many people who witnessed to them along the way. They will remember that person who came to them and gave them a tract, that person that left the Bible with them, that Gideon Bible that they discovered. They will remember the moments that God spoke to their hearts and they said, I don't want you to reign over me. I don't want to change my life. I'm happy. Status quo is good for me. Maybe at the end of life, I might think about it. And that, my friends, is the love of God. He goes right to the nth degree. And we know that even at the end of life, a person can accept Christ. So let us never give up and stop praying for people. Let us keep praying for people because even in the end of life, like the thief on the cross, they can turn to the Savior while there is yet time. The example, the second example Paul gives is an Old Testament example. We have a New Testament example himself and the Old Testament example, verses 2 and 4 to 4. Who's the example? Elijah. Oh, don't you just love this prophet Elijah? He is such a neat start. You know, anyone who says, I read the Old Testament and I just fall asleep and I just don't get it and I don't enjoy it, I don't know what Bible they're reading. Elijah is such a great example. And what do we have here? We have the story of Elijah from 1 Kings 19, 1 Kings 18. And what is it he says? Well, he says there, there's this great debate going on. Elijah has been called by God to make a famine. How do they make a famine? Stop the rain. Praise and the rains have stopped for three years. By the way, James, an aside to you guys who say you cannot change weather, remember this. James says, Elijah was a man of like passion and he prayed that it might not rain. And it did not rain. He uses Elijah's example of prayer about weather 
to say that his prayer was the reason why that weather. So let us never as Christians say before God, I can't do anything about the weather because you can, you can pray. And I don't know how many times many of you have prayed about the weather and God has graciously heard your prayer. I have experienced it in, in so many instances where we divinely went through a space of storms with tornadoes on either side of us. And these were not, this is not my exaggeration here. We were on a school class trip and people were praying about us and we were going north and there was literally black clouds and extreme high winds going on on either side of the vans as they traveled north on that particular trip. And we were praying about the weather and God made a way through the storm. He keeps doing that and he will do that for us. And so Elijah, what, what's happening? Well, he's prayed about the weather. The rains have not come. He has the great, the great miracle of Mount Carmel. The prophets of Baal, 450 of them, have been trying to get fire from heaven, the big contest between the Lord of hosts and Baal, the idol. Nothing happens for the Baal worshipers. And then Elijah says, let's, what, let's do something. Let's put the altar together as we should. Let's slay the, the oxen. Let's pour water on it till it's full of the trench and over top of the, let's make sure you know that this is legitimate. This isn't phony baloney. There's no fake news here. And he then goes ahead and calls upon the Lord to answer. And the Lord answers by fire. And it consumed not just the offering, not just the stones, not just the water in the trench. It licks up the whole shebang and it's gone consumed by fire. This has such a profound effect upon Israel at the time. They said, the Lord, the Lord, he is God. Jehovah is God. And so as he then prays for rain for the king, because he's now told by God that it's time to let the king know that there's rain coming, he outruns the, the, the king Jezebel, who the queen was a very wicked woman, says, I'm going to have this prophet Elijah before the day is out. And he starts running for his life. And he runs all the way from northern Israel, all the way down into Arabia to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And he runs. And halfway along the way, he calls, he, he, he's down sleeping because he has, he's run out of strength. And there's an angel that gives him angel food cake. And uh, yeah. he, uh, he, he goes on the strength of that, the two, two meals, he gets two meals out of the deal, and the water and the cakes, enough for him to go all the way. And there God meets him in the mountain of God. And what does, what happens there? That night he prays that he might die, verse 19. It's enough, Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my father's. Elijah was so discouraged. He had just had the most important revival at that point in all of Israel. But he's totally, he's totally physically drained. He's asking for death. He's tired. Take me out of here. He has no esteem. I'm no better than my father's. Classic example of cave depression. That's what we call that. And he's, he didn't know. He didn't know something that God knew. So he meets with the Lord. The Lord passes by. And what is it? There was a great wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces. Now that alone would have been just pretty amazing, but it says the Lord was not in the wind. And then after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. We've got to stop listening for the earthquakes and the fires and the great winds and start listening for that still small voice of the Lord. And when he heard it, he wrapped his face, came out. And what does God say? What are you doing here, Elijah? That's his little word. He said, like, what, what gives? You're my prophet. What are you doing down here? And he goes on to say, I've been zealous for the Lord. They've killed all your prophets. I alone am left. They seek to take my life too. And what does the Lord say? 
he says, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus and anoint King Haziel as king over Syria. And Jehu, son of Nimshi, was king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, as a prophet to take your place. And then he goes on to say, by the way, P.S., I have reserved 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed to Baal or kissed his mouth. What does he say? He's saying, Elijah, you're not alone here. I'm here to remind you this afternoon, you are not alone. You have resisted the wicked one and his agenda for the past many years. Continue the resistance. You are not alone. There are others who are going to stand with you. Maybe not right here, but they're standing in some other place and they're fighting the fight for Jesus. And you and I are soldiers in that fight. And so he says, even so there remains a remnant by the election of grace. And God has given a spirit of stupor to the nation of Israel, so that they should not see in ears that they should not hear. He quotes Isaiah 29, verse 10, when he says that. So he's not just making this up. He's taking Old Testament prophecy and saying, this is a fulfillment. However, there is a principle of grace. And the principle is this. If it was of works, then you could work your way to heaven. You could work your way into God's favor, but it's grace. It's grace to save you, it's grace to keep you. It's grace for service, it never works. And so when we talk about this message that Paul is trying to communicate, he reminds the believers then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not, for through their fall they provoke jealousy and salvation has come to the Gentiles. Wow, provoking of jealousy, huh? Of course, and as, a, as a, one that I've been studying in preparation for these messages, to put it this way, is jealousy ever a good thing? Of course, and explain how as a, as a junior team football player, one day the coach brought up a freshman, not even the same team. And he said, look at how he does the meat grinder. This fellow's name was LeBlanc. And this meat grinder exercise was an exercise where the football players moved down a line of eight huge football players, hitting each one in rapid succession with your head. You were headbutting them in the stomach. And that was part of the exercise called the, um, the meat grinder. You had to do it, it was a timed exercise, and it was apparent from the coach's point of view that they really were not really making a very great effort. So he brought in a freshman, first year student, young fella. He certainly made a, a, a good example. Corson said he got so angry with all the compliments that were given to the freshman that he, he, just, he just couldn't stand it. Here was this man that was not even part of their team and he was getting all the compliments that day. And so his own efforts doubled following this humiliation. Paul is saying here, uh, my prayer is that the Jewish people who hear the gospel will see all you Gentiles in Rome and they will get jealous of what you have with Jesus and they will get out there and give the gospel to their Jewish brothers and sisters and they will give the gospel to people who will listen because you are getting saved. Maybe God can use this to provoke them to jealousy. But he then goes on to say, look at this. In verse 17 and 16. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Now, if some of the branches were broken off, verse 17, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted among them. You have become a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. The olive tree was a symbol of Israel. And he's saying to the Gentiles, you're like a wild olive branch and you've been plucked out of your original tree and stuck into the root. That is Israel. That is the, the, all the information that is in the Old Testament. And he says, you're stuck out. And now here's the funny part. If you want to go online and you check out 
how do you um, graft all of branches? Do you know what it will tell you? It will tell you that the olive branch is what gives the good fruit. So it has to be a good olive tree branch that's put in to a wild trunk. That's what you will check. If you do, you will find that's the way grafting is done. But instead, he's saying, you are the wild olive branch. Now, if the wild olive branch can't produce olives on its own tree, how is it going to produce olives on the main good tree? Well, today you wouldn't do that. You'd say that's wasting your time. But in God's economy, he does it the opposite way. Why? Because he's changed the very nature of you. So you're no longer wild. You are brought into the sap of the, of the main tree and you're producing fruit for Jesus. Wow. Branches broken off that you might be grafted in. Don't be haughty. Remember, God did not spare the natural branches and he may not spare you either. So this is the opposite to what is normal, but then God loves to do things oppositely. And I'm so glad because with a little bit of this dexia, I don't mind that. Now, the final destiny of Israel is described in verses 25 to 36. And he begins by saying, I desire, brethren, that you should not be ignorant of this mystery. The word mystery is mysterium. It's a Greek word. It just means something that was not unveiled before. It's like when you get a birthday gift and you're looking at it, and somebody says, well, what, what's in it? What do you think's in it? And you shake it and you feel the weight of it and you kind of figure out what the person is who's given it to you, kind of put that into the, into the play. You might be able to guess it, but you might not. You know, there's pretty good odds that you probably will maybe get a few good guesses, but it's a mystery. You don't know what's in there. The mystery, there's lots of mysteries in the Bible. The mystery of the kingdom of God, Mark 4.11. The mystery described here in Romans 11, verse 25. The mystery that's described in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. There's many mysteries described. The mystery of the gospel, Ephesians 6, 19. The mystery, oh, I love this mystery. The mystery among the Gentiles. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Christ is in us. What a delightful thing to know that he is with us. But he's with us in the good and he's also with us in the bad. So remember, there's no such thing as a secret from God. He is with us. He sees our thoughts. He sees our actions. He knows us. And so do, we do well to remember that Christ is in us, the hope of glory. When he talks about this, he quotes Psalms 14, verse 1, and he says, And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's quoting Psalms 14, verse 1. But he's also quoting, in a certain sense, Luke 21, 24, where Jesus says, And so Jerusalem will be tread underfoot until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When was that time fulfilled? Well, some would say it was fulfilled in 1948. And the argument is, goes this. I, I, I subscribe a, a portion of this for sure because if you do the chronology, chronology of Abraham in the Old Testament, you will discover that he was born 948 years after Adam. Israel was reborn as a nation in the year 1948. Abraham received the first promise of Israel and the blessings that would be inherent in his lineage. And so it's rather significant in my view that the nation of Israel has been reborn on the very 1948 years following the Messiah. However, there are those who would say that Israel 
um, has always been receiving the message for the past 2,000 years, and they would teach that Israel is all those who by faith are incorporated into the Israel of God. And there are many who believe that as well. So I'm, I'm just going to leave that at that because uh, that could be a debate that we could get into for some time. The, the point that I think we need to remember is this. Israel has to do with the faith on the promises of God, not biological descendancy. However, in Isaiah 45 and, uh, and 48, I was reading this morning in those chapters, and uh, can a man, can a woman forget her children? No. And even I cannot forget you, O Israel. So um, there is a number of passages which would seem to suggest that Israel still has a place in God's plan somehow in the part that I don't completely understand. And oh, that's good because that just shows that God is God and he's much higher than all of us and he understands. And so as we look on this passage in Romans 11, I think the key again is this. Paul is saying there is a remnant there will always be a remnant from Israel, and there has been, and that there is those who will come to faith in Christ from the Gentiles, that God has brought the Gentiles into his family, and his, he says then, who has known the mind of the Lord, and who has become his counselor. Isn't it interesting, as we conclude today, God gave the name for his son, he said, you will name him Jesus. Now, this has to speak volumes to our hearts because Jesus is not a Jewish name. It would have been Joshua. Jesus is a Greek name. Can you imagine the repulsion of the early people as they hear about this rabbi from Nazareth, whose name is Jesus? Well, at least he could have been named Joshua. What gives here? God knew that that would be an offensive name. I'm convinced beyond a shadow. But for us, it's that beautiful name. Because he says, I welcome you with wide open arms, with nail prints in my hands, I welcome you because you who by faith have trusted my sacrifice are part of my kingdom, part of my family. And one day, God's going to say the same to those who will see their Redeemer and they will realize, just like Paul, that they've been fighting against the very one that's been calling them to himself. In the meantime, Paul says, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has become his counselor? Who has given to him that shall be repaid to him? He's quoting Isaiah 40, 13, Job 41, 1. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen.